Bill of Rights, those first ten amendments to the Constitution, seem fairly straightforward. You can read through them in the space of a television commercial break and print them out on a single piece of printing paper. A student could be forgiven for thinking that, with the Bill of Rights ratification late in the 18th century, the question of civil liberties, the legal protection for individuals provided by the Constitution, would be entirely settled. Unfortunately, there's a lot more subtlety and uncertainty surrounding those Ten Amendments and the question of civil liberties in general than you might think. They play a central role in the biggest question of modern American government. What are the civil liberties every American should enjoy? The most famous amendment is, of course, the First Amendment, the one where the founders tossed all their favorite rights in a jumble and said, let's throw them all together. It always reminds me a bit of how I'd handle a genie who only gave me three wishes. I'd cleverly cram as many desires as possible into a single wish. Similarly, the First Amendment includes the freedoms of speech, religion, press, petition, and assembly. Basically, these were the rights the Founders had seen King George III trample, and these were the rights citizens needed when they wanted to complain about something they saw as a problem with their government. We needed to be able to speak without being jailed for our opinions. We needed to be able to gather in groups in order to speak together. We needed to be able to petition the government when we saw something wrong. And the press needed to be able to write and, when they saw the need, complain about the actions of government. In fact, the only addition that doesn't quite fit the pattern is freedom of religion. But only if you don't know your history. For much of history, a big factor that determined whether you could serve in a government or voice an opinion about one without being tarred and feathered was your religion. We call this a religious test for office. And the American colonies were among the first places in the world where there was no religious requirements for participation in government. Considered in this light, freedom of religion fits right in with the rest of the First Amendment rights. The amendment prohibits Congress from making any law respecting an establishment of religion, the Establishment Clause, or preventing the free exercise or practice of a religion by individuals, the Free Exercise Clause. Yes, they can and often do come into conflict. We're going to talk about that later. The Second Amendment has become more and more controversial over the years, so much so that even commenting on it is a bit risque one way or another. It reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. What does that mean? There are two schools of thought on that. Presented without interpretation, they boil down to, one, Americans have a right to possess firearms without limit, or two, Americans have a right to possess firearms within government-set regulations. The Third Amendment is basically a leftover from the pre-revolution complaints. The government can't make you house soldiers without your permission, which was something the British did fairly regularly. Amendment 4 through Amendment 8 lay out some basic rights concerning courtrooms and the criminal justice system. The Fourth prohibits unreasonable search and seizure without probable cause, meaning the police can't search your home or take your stuff just because they don't like your t-shirt. The fifth protects the rights of due process, meaning a judge can't skip steps in the process because he doesn't like your t-shirt, and prohibits self-incrimination and double jeopardy, being tried for the same crime more than once. The Sixth Amendment calls for fair and speedy public trials by jury. The Seventh also guarantees jury trials, this time for certain non-criminal cases, and the Eighth prohibits cruel and unusual punishments. That's a lot of rights, my friend, crammed into eight amendments. Wait a sec, I hear you say. Isn't the Bill of Rights the first ten amendments? Where are the other two? Good eye. The remaining two amendments provided a little bit of comfort for founders who might have realized the Articles of Confederation were too lax, or weren't really that hot on creating a strong central government. The Ninth Amendment took care of that pesky 
problem of rights not mentioned in the Constitution, and said that just because a right wasn't mentioned didn't mean it did not exist and would not be protected. The Tenth Amendment would round everything out by saying that any powers and responsibilities that the Constitution did not specifically grant to the federal government would be the sole responsibility of the states. This amendment was destined to play a big role in the argument over which would reign supreme, state or federal power. Speaking of which, we can return to our original question. What civil liberties should all Americans enjoy? If you are in no mood to dive into political philosophy in a shocking condition, then you might simply answer the ones specifically mentioned in the Bill of Rights. And there lies the problem, even with that simple answer. And it's the area of the authority of state legislatures versus the power of the federal government. In early U.S. history, with the case of Barron v. Baltimore in 1833, it was decided by the Supreme Court the Bill of Rights actually didn't apply to the various states at all, only to legislation considered by the national government. That would mean that a particular state like Texas could decide via its own legislature to extend or deny civil liberties as they wished. If a state legislature voted to enact a law denying left-handed redheads the right to freedom of speech, the barren decision would have supported that. In other words, the Bill of Rights, even if we take it exactly as written, was not, in early American history, considered to apply to all Americans automatically, but only when the states where they lived approved of those rights. That it might have remained the case if the nation had not been ripped apart by another issue that involved federal power stacked against state authority, the Civil War. In the aftermath of that conflict, the supremacy of the central government was considered established, but also a bevy of new constitutional amendments were passed, and among them was the 14th Amendment. It states, in part, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. This clause was used to justify a reevaluation of civil liberties in 1925 in a case brought before the Supreme Court called Gitlow v. New York. The case involved a state abridging the freedom of speech of citizens. The court, for the first time, stated that the First Amendment, by virtue of the 14th Amendment's guarantee of both due process and equal protection, applied universally to all American citizens no matter where they lived. It was the first of several cases that moved to officially apply the Bill of Rights to all citizens regardless of state-passed legislation, process known as the incorporation doctrine because you're incorporating the Bill of Rights nationally. This was something that the federal government had been trying to do ever since the end of the Civil War. In 1868, Ulysses S. Grant encouraged a senator named James G. Blaine to propose a constitutional amendment that would explicitly state the supremacy and applicability of the Bill of Rights over the various states. Even in the supercharged atmosphere of federal power over states that was the Reconstruction era, the Blaine Amendment failed to pass. Americans remained leery of too much power taken from local hands and placed into the hands of a central government. Almost 60 years would pass before the Gitlow case resurrected the idea of incorporation, even if in a piecemeal way. Over the last century, most of the Bill of Rights mentioned civil liberties were officially found by the Supreme Court to apply to all citizens, especially during the civil rights movement of the 1960s. One such case involved the freedom of religious practice, the 1962 case of Engel v. Vitale. In that case, it was found that a state government could not mandate all students recite a particular prayer. The Engel case provided for the freedom of religion's application to all the states, but it did not provide a comprehensive interpretation of what the First Amendment's words about religion did and did not allow. Thomas Jefferson 
set off a kind of delayed action time bomb when, in a private letter posted in 1802, he penned the phrase about a, quote, wall of separation between church and state, end quote, which wins first prize when it comes to contentious phrases, just barely edging out that other personal favorite, which is, we need to talk. Almost immediately, arguments arose over just what those words meant and whether it mattered at all, considering they came from a private letter and not a piece of legislation. Flash forward a few years towards the argument over the ratification of the Constitution, and you'll find religious freedom enshrined in the First Amendment. It is the lead-off hitter and the roll call of rights included in the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Like all rights mentioned in the Bill of Rights, the question of what exactly the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment means have been up for grabs various times in the nation's history. The Supreme Court, down through the years, has been remarkably consistent on interpreting the meaning and scope of the Establishment Clause, starting with a pretty definitive statement in the case of Reynolds v. United States in 1878. Freedom of religion means freedom to hold an opinion or belief, but not to take action in violation of social duties or subversive to good order. The court decided. Of course, that decision itself has been fairly vague, something the Supreme Court tried to rectify almost a century later with the decision in Lemon v. Kurtzman, which happened in 1971, which set up the so-called Lemon Test to see if the government could constitutionally interfere in a potentially religious action. The Lemon Test, still used to this day, states that legislation or actions by local or federal government officials violate the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment if 1. The statute or practice in question lacks a secular or non-religious purpose, 2. The statute or practice in question seeks as a principal effect to advance or inhibit religion, or Three, the statute or practice in question fostered an excessive government entanglement with religion. Interestingly enough, the Lima decision also decided that the wall of separation between church and state could never be absolute. And I quote, The line of separation, far from being a wall, is a blurred, indistinct, and variable barrier depending on all the circumstances of a particular relationship. End quote. In 2002, for instance, the court decided in Zelman v. Simmons-Harris that the government could offer vouchers for a state's student to attend private schools run by a religious institution. Each and every phrase, even word in the Bill of Rights has to be debated, interpreted, and constitutionality of legislation is weighed against the outcome of those debates within the chamber of the Supreme Court. This debate has raged over and over in respect to almost every single amendment in the Bill of Rights. For instance, consider the arguments that erupted over the portion of the First Amendment which states that Congress shall enact no law abridging the freedom of speech. Does that mean, as it seems to, that the U.S. government cannot prohibit a citizen from saying whatever they might please? Anyone who has spent any time in a classroom knows that can't quite be right. After all, when you turned around to talk to your friends in grade school, you were scolded by your teacher, and if you continued to exercise your tongue, you were punished. If you accept that there are cases wherein a government can limit speech, then you must also accept the necessity for the Supreme Court to interpret where the line is between what is permissible and what is not. One such case involved a war. During the First World War, Congress passed the Espionage Act, which made it a crime for anyone to criticize the American war effort. Yes, you heard me correctly. A man named Charles Schenck promptly violated that law. He distributed leaflets urging American men to resist being drafted into the armed forces. In the case of Schenck v. United States, the Supreme Court found that the First Amendment's protection of speech could be overridden if the speech in question presented a, quote, clear and present danger of substantive evils, end quote. Another case, Brandenburg v. Ohio in 1969, 
would scale back the Schenck decision, which was widely seen as far too permissive of government interference. The Brandenburg decision justified government suppression or punishment of speech under a stricter guideline than the vague, clear and present danger. If the speech in question was aimed at inciting imminent, lawless action, it could be censored. Here, with just two cases, we find that a simple phrase in the First Amendment becomes not so simple after all. A third case makes things even more complicated. Speech is often equated to the word expression, and the idea of freedom of expression is often said to be protected by the First Amendment. Indeed, the Supreme Court has ruled that non-verbal symbolic actions can not only be considered speech, but also can be protected by the First Amendment. For instance, in Texas v. Johnson, which occurred in 1989, it was decided that the burning of the American flag was a symbolic act of expression political protest, and as such, equated to speech that was protected. Can the government stop something from being published or said because it doesn't like the content? We call that kind of thing prior restraint, and the court has usually said a resounding no, beginning with the case of Near v. Minnesota in 1931. This was only reinforced by the case of the Pentagon Papers in the 70s. That's when a former Pentagon staffer leaked classified documents to the New York Times that revealed that America's involvement in the war in Vietnam and other Southeast Asian countries had been much more extensive than the government had revealed. The government sued to prevent the New York Times from publishing the documents, but the court ruled in New York Times v. United States that this would amount to prior restraint and the documents were published. You begin to get the idea of how difficult the Bill of Rights can be. It's amazing just how many situations can arise that require the Supreme Court to analyze and interpret even the tiniest phrases and seemingly the most explicitly stated of civil liberties given in the Bill of Rights. Some phrases, however, are not so explicitly stated. For instance, the Second Amendment, often cited as the right to bear arms, is oddly structured and worded, and has led to continued controversy in today's society. It states, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. In 2008, the Supreme Court decided in the case of Columbia v. Heller and held that the right of an individual to own a firearm and to use it for lawful purposes like self-defense was not tied to membership in or service in a militia. Like all such cases, there continue to be calls for the Supreme Court to revise its original opinion, calls that apply equally to the landmark case of Roe v. Wade, 1979. In this famous decision, the court heard the complaint of a woman named Norma McCorvey. She was going by the pseudonym of Jane Roe. She argued that the state of Texas was violating her rights by preventing her from obtaining an abortion, except in life-threatening situations. The argument was that the Bill of Rights included an unwritten right to privacy, a concept that past courts had agreed with. Despite the fact that the words right to privacy had never appeared explicitly in the constitutional amendments, the Supreme Court recognize that other parts of the Bill of Rights can cast a shadow that would include a generalized right for Americans to have a personal life free from government interference. The decision in Roe v. Wade swung on these arguments, with the court deciding that abortion could not be prohibited by the states during the first trimester or three months of a woman's pregnancy, and prohibited only on certain occasions during the second trimester. It's useful to look at one final area of civil liberties in the Bill of Rights, the area where they intersect with a government's need to provide justice and police society. Collectively, the rights accorded to those suspected of a crime can come under the heading of due process, guaranteed everyone by the 14th Amendment. In 1961, the Supreme Court decided in Map v. Ohio that the Fourth Amendment, which prohibited unreasonable searches and seizures by police, should apply and be enforced 
on the various state governments, the incorporation doctrine coming into effect. This solidified the need for police to show probable cause before making an arrest or beginning a search. Probable cause refers to reasonable grounds for suspicion. Shortly thereafter, in 1963, the court decided in the case of Gideon v. Rainwright that the Sixth Amendment, which includes the right to counsel, applied to those accused of a felony in any state, meaning that everyone would have a lawyer to represent them. Again, incorporation doctrine coming into effect. Finally, another civil liberty from the Bill of Rights was extended to cover every American in every state. The Fifth Amendment's right to refuse self incrimination. In Miranda v. Arizona, 1966, the court influenced the creation of the now standard Miranda warning, which suspected persons are told upon their arrest, informing them in plain language of their Fifth Amendment rights. The typical Miranda warning states that a suspect has the right to remain silent and that anything they choose to do to say can be used against them in a court of law. You might sound familiar from Oh, a metric ton of movies and TV shows you've seen. It also states that they have the right to an attorney and that one will be provided by the state if the suspect cannot afford one. The concept of American rights, as you can see, is not as cut and dried as we would like to think.